Hey everyone and welcome back to another Unreal C++ tutorial. In this video I'll be showing you how to use the input bindings and using the player input component. Um, I'll be doing this in the character class to begin. So to save a little bit of time I've got most of this set up ahead of recording so I'm assuming that you'll know how to set up and create a character class. I already had a character class in the project, it's very basic, it doesn't have anything in it at the moment. By the end of the video we'll have something which can move around like this. And just so you know what to do in the project settings, under the input setup in the project settings, I have some actions and axis mapping. So just a single action mapping for jump, which is using the space bar and the axis mappings. I have W and S for moving forward and backwards and move right for uh, set to D and A for moving left and right. And just make a note of the scale values here as well, because these are going to be very important and they will be used or referenced in the code. So to move forward, we're using a positive value and backwards, we're using a negative value. Next, the final thing, when I have the character class, I've gone ahead and created a blueprint version of this named BP underscore character. I've also created a blueprint game mode called BP underscore game mode. And I've set these to be the project default so that when we press play, the game mode will automatically assign the character class to be the default character used so that we can gain control of that and move around. So they are the project settings. So just go ahead and if you don't already have that or the concept of doing that, then maybe take a step back and do that. Otherwise, create a character, create a game mode, get that ready to go and we can move over to the code. Brilliant. So as I said, a very basic and simple character class going here. So in the header file, uh, you can see I've not needed to add any extra forward declarations or any other classes. I have created a private section towards the bottom of the code file. So go ahead and create that if you want to keep things exactly the same. I've created two new functions, one named move forward, one named move right, both of type void and both taking in a float argument named value. So this is the bit I said to remember uh, how you're setting up the input bindings. So I'm just gonna pop back over to the project. So this input value that we have in the code file or the header at the moment is going to directly be relating to the scale value that we're passing in when we press a button. So this is what's going to allow us to know whether we're pressing forward or backwards, for instance, or left or right. It will take that value and it's going to be either zero if nothing's being pressed. If you're using an analog, it will be something between zero and one or minus one. If you're using a key press like here, it will be either one or minus one, uh, no in between. Okay, so that is why we're using these. So these are going to be driving our movement functions based on the scale value that we're passing in. Okay, over in the code file, very simple again. I do not have any other class includes or libraries here. Uh, what I have done, um, I've left these functions. You can take these out if you need, but it's not relevant to the topic at the moment, the begin play and the tick. What we do want to focus on though is the setup player input component. So this is where we're going to actually assign our bindings to the inputs that we've created in our project. And the way that we can do this, if we do the axes, first of all, as both of these will be the same for the move forward and the move right, we start by using this player input component, which is being passed in as an argument in the function call. So that is the thing recording and processing the player input. We then want to use the bind axis function. The first argument this takes is a text macro. So we can either say text and then the binding that we want to use. So I'm going to start with the move forward. And this bit is actually very uh, optional. You could remove the brackets here and the text and just use the move forward inside of quotes as the first argument for this override either one of these will work next we have the object reference which is just going to be this object so what we're calling the function on and then the address of the class which the function is located which is the move forward function we're going to bind this to when the move forward input is pressed so that will be the ampersand a character base move forward okay so that has now bound the key bindings that you set up in the project to the function that we'll be implementing in just a moment, but we'll get there in just a moment. So we're going to take exactly the same steps for the player input component and then binding the axis for the move right key bindings. And again, this is all going to be case sensitive and needing to be spelt exactly the same way. Uh, so again, not including spaces if you haven't done so in the project settings name. Next, we'll have the object reference, which again will be this and the same a character base move right function binding. Okay, so the next thing is to handle our action, which is uh, I've set up a jump key so that we can actually use the jump functionality as well. For this, the beginning is very similar. So we're going to use the player input component, but this time we want to call the bind action function. 
The first argument in this is again very similar, which is a text macro taking in the name of the key that you're binding this to, which I've just called jump. So again, from the project settings, then rather than taking the object reference straight away, uh, because there are multiple states in a action compared to the axis, which is either constantly held or released, for the action here, we're going to account for when it's pressed and also when it's released. So we do that using the IE input event underscore pressed. Then we're going to want to pass in this object. And then finally, uh, there's a couple of ways you can handle this. You could create a jump function in the A character base class uh, in the same way that I've done that for the move forward and the move right function. But because we're using the character class and it has so much kind of going on under the hood and so many uh, pre-built functions for us, that already actually has a jump function. It also tracks things automatically like multiple jumps, double jumping, uh, the number of times you've jumped, whether you're in the air or landed. So we're going to make use of that. And to do this, we call the A character class instead of the custom class we've just created. So you can see how I'm using the address of A character rather than my A character base. And then from a character, I'm calling the jump function. Now that will tell us that the jump is being held. And like I said, we also want to make sure that the character class is able to track everything to account for things like double jumping and landing. So what we're going to do next is use the player input component, then the bind action again to the jump. So actually binding it to the same key, but this time the key event is going to be the IE underscore released. And again, that will be on this object at the address of the A character again, but this will call the function stop jumping. So this will just give a notify to the character class that the jump button has been released. So you can check the code there if you want to see what that's doing, but it's basically making sure that everything's kind of cleared out, ready to land if that's the case, uh, ready to check if there's a double jump available and all of those good things. And it also means that using this, we don't have to create our own jump functionality, which is always good if we can save a little bit of time. Okay, so now getting on to the meat of things, we have bound these to either functions that exist or our own functions. So now I'm going to go down and implement the uh, move forward and the move right functions. So make sure that you have these two functions uh, already implemented in the code file as you would any other function. For the move forward, what I'm going to do is create a new F vector named direction. And I'm going to set this to be equal to the F rotation matrix, which will allow us to get the rotation from our controller. And then I'm going to say get control rotation and we'll get this scaled along the axis, which we'll use the E axis. And this is going to be the X axis. X is forward in Unreal. So that's how we're going to get the forward. Many ways that you can get the rotation that you want for movement. This is just a nice clean way to get it all in one line. And then with our new direction, we can say under this add movement input, which again is a pre-built function in Unreal that comes uh, ready to use with the character class for pawns and things, which I'll go into details in another video. This will be a little bit more complex, but with characters, we can just pass in the direction. And again, remember our float value that we're getting from our function argument, which is going to take the direction we want to move that we've just calculated and then multiply that by either one, minus one or zero. So if you get zero, you're not moving. If you get one, you're moving forward. If you get minus one, you're moving back. That's how the key bindings are working. We're then going to do something very, very similar for the move right. So we're going to get the F vector named direction from the F rotation matrix. Again, using the controller, get controller rotation, get scaled axis. This time, uh, left to right is, of course, along the y-axis. Z is up, so that's the only other remaining axis we could have used. And with that value, again, we're going to call the add movement input, passing in the direction, multiplied by the value, and that will get us moving left and right. So if you wanted to extend this, you'd normally add some similar things to like a mouse binding for con uh, controller rotation to get the camera moving. But I just wanted to make sure that we can see how the input bindings to the axis and the actions are relating to the function calls. And with this done, that is pretty much everything. So you can now compile this and we can move back over to the engine. So of course, you've already seen that I had this ready to go. Everything was working. So with that all compiled, you can now come in, press play. As I've said, assuming that you have all of the project set up correctly, the game modes, the character class as the defaults, you can come in and you should be able to move around like so. The great thing about having this as a blueprint is I can navigate to the character class and again, a lot of things are being handled as part of the really kind of huge character class that comes built with the engine. Although we're calculating a direction and we're multiplying that by the value of the key pressed that's being returned, you may have noticed we've not set things like how fast we should move, uh, which if you're familiar with 
things like Unity or Godot, you normally have to do all of that by yourself from scratch. So you may be wondering where that's coming from. So just a quick look at the character class whilst you're here. This is all coming from the character movement component and the speed is already being accounted for as part of the movement function that we've used from this walk speed. So if we change the walk speed to let's say 1200 and press play, then we're now going to move at double the speed we were previously again, just accounting for the direction we want to move and the key that we're pressing. And there you go. So this is uh, all of the things that we've done and I forgot to show the jump in fact, so I'm going to come back and press jump. And there we go, we can see that the jump key is working as well. So we've got the movement and the jump all kind of coming from the character class implementations of those. So all we've really needed to do is call the, the functions that already exist to make a very simple move function ourselves, and then bind those to the input keys that we've set in the project. So if you wanted to know more about how to do kind of some of what's going on underneath the character class by yourself, if you wanted a little bit more control or just to get the, the concept, then the next topics I'll be covering are the pawn classes. And this is going to be a class which we need to do a lot more than just kind of call pre-existing functions. So it'll be a little bit more in depth, but it will give you a better understanding of how to account for speed by the direction by the key press and things like that. But hopefully this was useful to see how to get the character class working in C++. I'll leave this video here for now. And as always, if you enjoyed the video or found it useful, please do leave a like and share the video around. That is always appreciated and greatly helps the channel. Another really big thank you to all of my Patreon supporters. And of course, if you're watching this early, you can also get the download of the project already as well through the Patreon exclusive content. So do check that out if you wanted to take a little dig through the code and look at exactly how I've set everything up for the demonstration. As ever though, thanks for watching and I will see you all next time.